There is a lot of stuff that people are looking for in a good book. They want an interesting premise, compelling characters, an engaging, unpredictable story, and a whole host of other stuff that I'm not going to bother you all with explaining. You know what you like. But maybe the most important part of a good book, the basis for how characters truly impress themselves upon you, is the dialogue. And it goes without saying, it doesn't just have to be books either. TV, movies, plays, you name it, they have dialogue. And it also goes without saying that we know good dialogue when we hear it. But what goes into actually making good dialogue? How can a beginning writer, or even an expert, pick up on what is good and what isn't? Well, my quick caveat to that opening statement is that each person will have a different view of what good dialogue is, and that is kind of the beauty of dialogue. It is different things to different people. Some people hate the dialogue of the mid-20th century movies. Some love it. Same goes for the movies of today. I can't tell you how to write dialogue that everyone will find interesting, because honestly, it is impossible. But what I can tell you is that, generally, good dialogue is all about taking small steps towards achieving a grand goal. For all of you that wish to write, Characters should never just talk to talk. Everything on the page is a test of a reader's attention span, and therefore every word needs to be carefully chosen so that the reader feels like they are receiving a good product based on their time of investment. Character dialogue should either further the plot, the characters themselves, or the world. And yes, those are written in order of importance. If your dialogue does not achieve these things, it may be best to do some rewrites. Now, in an effort to show how these principles are used in action, we can look at how George R. R. Martin writes his dialogue. Cause you know, he's halfway decent at it. And if we're going to do something on this channel, we're going to do it right. So this video will be featuring, in my opinion, Martin's best written character, the full mouthed half man himself, Tyrion, and him verbally castrating our favorite slobbering invertebrate, Janos Slint. The excerpts that follow are from A Clash of Kings chapter 8 for all that care, and we can start off with how to progress the plot and themes with dialogue. It was her brother I was speaking of, Jor Mormont, the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. When I was visiting him on the wall, he mentioned how concerned he was about finding a good man to take his place. The Watch gets so few good men these days. Tyrion grinned. He'd sleep easier if he had a man like you, I imagine. Or the valiant Alardine. Lord Janos roared. Small chance of that. So, in the dialogue given, the theme of the scene is set. And because Martin is an experienced, detail-oriented author, it happens without the audience ever really noticing it. This entire chapter revolves around Janos being ousted from King's Landing and becoming a Night's Watchman. Of course, Janos thinks this will never happen. Setting up this theme and the plot not only progresses it naturally, it allows us to see the genius of Tyrion and the utter spinelessness of Janos Slint as characters. My mentor and friend, best-selling author Michael Datcher, gave me the best advice I had ever heard about writing. Advance the plot through dialogue. His mindset behind this ideology was that any bum off the street could write pages upon pages of things happening. Telling events is one thing, but bringing a story to life is another. And for a story to have life, there needs to be characters, interactions between them, and consequences for those interactions. Yes, you can tell a compelling story with characters that don't speak, although it might be a bit avant-garde for my taste, but the majority of us are drawn to stories that have characters with interesting voices. Tyrion is definitely one of these characters, and Martin has used Tyrion's allure as a tool to progress the plot at crucial points in the narrative. Next, in the paragraphs to come, you can see the simple logical steps that Martin takes to arrive at certain important plot-related sentences. These pieces of information are delivered naturally because of the easy transitions that lead up to them. This is another mark of a competent, effective writer. In the dialogue that follows, take notice of how Tyrion uses related topics or items to go from Jor Mormont and the Wall all the way to how Joffrey is a poor king. One would think, Tyrion said, but life does take queer turns. Consider Eddard Stark, my lord. I don't suppose he ever imagined he would end up on the steps of Baelor's Sept. There were few as did, Lord Janos allowed, chuckling. Tyrion chuckled too. A pity I wasn't here to see it. They say even Varys was surprised. Lord Janos laughed so hard his gut shook. The spider, he said, knows everything they say. Well, he didn't know that. How could he? Tyrion put the first hint of a chill on his tone. He had helped persuade my sister that Stark should be pardoned, on the condition that he take the black. A. Eh? Janos Slint blinked vaguely at Tyrion. My sister, Cersei, Tyrion repeated, a shade more strongly, in case the fool had some doubt who he meant. The Queen Regent. Oh, yes, Slint took a swallow. As to that, well, the king commanded it, my lord. The king himself. The king is thirteen, Tyrion reminded him. Still, he is the king. Slint's jowls quivered when he frowned. The lord of the seven kingdoms? Well, one or two of them at least. Tyrion said with a sour smile. 
In the dialogue stated, we go from the Night's Watch to the execution of Ned Stark, to Varys, to Cersei, and end at Joffrey and his poor rule. We also get a nice reiteration of the themes again. The Night's Watch is where Janos will ultimately end up, and Ned Stark's death, among other things, is the reason that Tyrion has contention with Janos in the first place. Think of writing dialogue like this. Picture you are standing on a life-size chessboard. You are on one end, but you want to get to the complete opposite side. However, you also want to get to the other side without touching any white tiles. Well, the most logical way to accomplish this task would be to move from adjacent black tile to adjacent black tile. Little by little, you come closer to your goal until you finally arrive. Now, instead of a chessboard, picture a scene or narrative. Instead of white tiles, picture leaps of belief and logic. Instead of black tiles, picture related topics or items. You still want to get to the end of the scene or narrative, and you still want to avoid as many leaps of belief and logic as possible. By using related topics and items to go from one subject to the next, you can traverse a scene or narrative without ever breaking believability or continuity. This is not only the essence of dialogue, it is the essence of good storytelling as a whole. Next, we can look at making less into more with dialogue. Like I said before, everything on the page is a test of a reader's attention span, so making the most of the little attention that they give you is super important. A great writer can deliver a thousand words of thought with only a hundred on the page. Let's take a look at how Martin uses Tyrion's dialogue to give almost every single one of the dwarf's lines a double meaning. Might I have a look at your spear? My spear? Lord Janos blinked in confusion. Tyrion pointed. The clasp that fashions your cape. Hesitantly, Lord Janos drew out the ornament and handed it to Tyrion. Hmm, we have goldsmiths in Lannisport who do better work, he opined. The red enamel blood is a shade much, if you don't mind my saying. Tell me, my lord, did you drive the spear into the man's back yourself, or did you only give the command? So here we have some pretty subtle use of dialogue. Packing symbolic meaning into dialogue with strong face value is an expert way to do more with less. It builds themes, primes the reader for later events, but is also character building, as it demonstrates the intelligence of characters shrewd enough to use such speech techniques. In this example, Jano Slint became a lord by aiding in the capture of Ned Stark and preserving the royal status of Joffrey and his relatives. In doing so, Janos was granted lands and therefore needed a sigil. He chose a spear, the same tool used against Ned Stark. In Westeros, George R. R. Martin has demonstrated a concept where the characters closely identify with their sigil. The Lannisters refer to themselves as lions, the Starks as wolves, the Targaryens as dragons, and so on and so forth. This is important because it sets the tone of characters being intimately tied to what their sigil is in Westerosi custom. This is all to say that when Tyrion takes Janos' cape fastener, which bears the spear of his sigil, Tyrion is effectively taking Janos' identity into his grip. The representation that Janos Slint has chosen for himself in the world is now in the hands of another man. Furthermore, when Tyrion remarks that he has seen better gold in Lannisport, then immediately follows up with a question of Janos' actions, he essentially is stating the fact that Janos engaged in a terrible deed for a prize that is not even truly valuable. Lastly, Tyrion asks if Janos stabbed Ned himself or just ordered it. This is a reference to the northern custom of the one who passes the sentence must swing the sword, again evoking Ned Stark and highlighting how spineless Janos really is. Lastly, we can look at how Martin controls our movement through the events of the scene through dialogue. I gave the command, and I'd give it again. Lord Stark was a traitor. The bald spot in the middle of Slint's head was beet red, and his cloth of gold cape had slithered off his shoulders onto the floor. The man tried to buy me. Little dreaming, you had already been sold. Slint slammed down his wine cup. Are you drunk? If you think I will sit here and have my honor questioned, what honor is that? I do admit, you made a better bargain than Sir Jacelyn. A lordship and a castle for a spear thrust in the back? And you didn't even need to thrust the spear. He tossed the golden ornament back to Jano Slint. It bounced off his chest and clattered to the floor as the man rose. Here we see a drastic change in the dialogue. Whereas Tyrion was tactful and precise just a moment ago, we see now that he is overt and aggressive. Here's an example of the audience learning alongside Janos, even though the chapter POV is from the perspective of Tyrion. This is how suspenseful writing is done. Even though Tyrion had everything planned already, Martin did not let the audience know that in order to maintain the draw in the scene. Just in these two pages, we've had laughter, confusion, suspicion, fear, and rudeness, all delivered by way of dialogue. This is a very dynamic scene, and by keeping the audience in the informational shoes of Janos, we experience these situations with him. The only difference is that we are rooting for Tyrion, while Janos, well, isn't. So, I know there is a bunch more to cover in this chapter, including the near-biblically satisfying moment where Janos is ousted from King's Landing to serve at the Wall, but I will take my own advice and make less into more by stopping here. 
Hopefully this breakdown was just a little bit helpful to those of you who had questions about dialogue. This has always been my favorite part of writing, but also the part that requires the most thought and technique. If you like what you heard and want to support the channel, or want to check out how I use dialogue in my own writing, check out my book on Amazon. As always, it was a pleasure, and I will talk to you again next week.